Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. Now, I've been thinking a lot recently about witch hunts, perhaps because that term has been badged about far more frequently than it deserves to have been. And I got to thinking, well, what about our real witch hunts? So today's video is going to talk about the last person to be tried, convicted and punished under a witchcraft statute in this country, England. Now, do you know what date that happened? If you do, or you fancy having a guess, please pop it in the comments section down below. I understand if you want to hold fire and see if you were right. If you were right, or if you were wrong about your guess, then perhaps you want to leave that in the comments section down below. Let's go. I'm feeling pretty frisky today, so I've decided that I'm not going to give you that date at the top of the video. Instead, I'm going to give you a series of dates and events that relate to witchcraft acts and the punishment of witches in England. Perhaps if you don't already know the date of the event that I'm talking about, you might feel more comfortable having a guess with this information in hand. For many centuries, accusations of witchcraft were thought of as ecclesiastical crimes, best dealt with by the church courts. The church may recommend confession, penance, public recantation, maybe even excommunication. In the most extreme cases, perhaps of somebody who has been convicted or confessed to witchcraft, who then relapses, the church may recommend that they are punished as a relapsed heretic, which isn't very pleasant. However, this is because of a marked shift that occurred in medieval Christianity. The early Christian church viewed witchcraft and witch hunts as pagan superstition. They didn't think it was possible that a human being could garner such supernatural skills. However, following, we believe, the writings of St Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, the church's opinion began to shift. They began to think that maybe it might be possible, and therefore they took an interest in pursuing and prosecuting for it. However, Accusations of witchcraft did not remain in the church courts forever in England. In 1542, Henry VIII, perhaps inspired by his new role as head of the Church of England, has his parliament write an act where, for the first time, witchcraft is defined as a crime punishable by death. In 1547, Edward VI repeals his father's act. In 1563, Elizabeth I restores the act, albeit in a gentler form. She only demands death if harm has been done to another person. In 1604, James I accedes to the English throne and with his government, he sees that Elizabeth's act is expanded to sentence a person to death for invoking evil spirits or communicating with familiar spirits. In addition, in the King James version of the Bible, Exodus 22:18 is translated as thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. It is relevant, I think, that this is argued to have been a mistranslation, and witch could, in fact, also mean poisoner, herbalist, or a person who uses magic for evil. Both Elizabeth's Act of 1563 and James's Act of 1604 transfer witchcraft trials from the church to ordinary courts. In 1735, there is a shift. George II's Parliament repeals the laws against witchcraft. However, the Act of 1735 sets down that fines or imprisonment should be used against those who claimed to be able to use magical powers. In 1824, the Vagrancy Act makes fortune-telling, astrology and spiritualism punishable offences. In 1951, the 1735 Act by George II's government is repealed and replaced in favour of the Fraudulent Mediums Act. It is not until 2008 that all acts relating to witchcraft are finally repealed. Well, that is the timeline for witchcraft acts in England. Bearing that in mind, where do you think would be the most appropriate place for us to put the last person to be tried, convicted and punished for a witchcraft-related offence in England? What year? Would you be surprised if I told you it was 1944? Well, let's find out more 
about the person who suffered this penalty. Helen Duncan was born in Scotland in 1897 as Victoria Helen McFarlane. On the 27th of May 1916, she marries Henry Duncan and he would be beside her as she develops her career and reputation as a psychic and medium. She was both fated and discredited, with seemingly equal vehemence on either side. During World War II, the Duncans moved from Scotland to Portsmouth, which was the headquarters of the Royal Navy Home Fleet. So there were lots of family members around who were incredibly worried about what was happening to their loved ones. At one seance that she hosted in Portsmouth, she had a sailor appear. That sailor apparently announced that he had sunk with the HMS Barham. This sinking occurred on the 23rd of November 1941. The Barham was sunk by a German submarine and the whole 849 crew members were lost. The problem with this was that the sinking of the Barham was not public information and it remains unclear how Helen Duncan found it out. Some believe, although it has not been fully confirmed, that the powers that be had decided that the way Helen Duncan found this out was because she had communication with the enemy, that she was somehow an agent working for Germany. Three years later, on the 19th of January 1944, police raided another seance that was being hosted by Helen Duncan. She and her three audience members were charged under the 1824 Vagrancy Act. She was, however, indicted under the 1735 Act. After an eight-day trial, during which the defence offered for Helen Duncan to host a seance in the courtroom, that request was denied, she was found guilty and sentenced to nine months in prison. In the end, she served six of those nine months. So why does the British state come down so hard on Helen Duncan? Why are they seemingly making an example of her in 1944? Well, I think to explain that, we need to go back to what she did in 1941. When she shares her knowledge of the sinking of the HMS Barham, that's got to be a cause for concern. There is no legitimate or explainable way that she could have had that information when she did. So either she is a real psychic and clairvoyant who doesn't know when to not share information, or she is getting that information from somewhere that she shouldn't, perhaps from the enemy state of Germany. And if information is coming into Great Britain in a way that can't be traced by the British government, then potentially it could be leaving in a similar fashion. With D-Day on the horizon and her living in Portsmouth, the headquarters of the home fleet of the British Navy, there is no way that the British government is going to tolerate the potential that she could be in contact with Germany. It's also possible that they wanted to stop her from hosting seances at which she would charge people to speak to their deceased loved ones, some of whom may have been lost in World War II. These were people that had already lost enough, and maybe the government saw that Helen Duncan was attempting to profit off of their misery. But I'd love to know what you think of Helen Duncan and her case, so let me know in the comment section down below, or come and find me over on my social media. I'll be leaving the links in the description box. You can follow me there, and we can continue the conversation. I hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, please let me know by clicking the like button. Please also subscribe to my channel and click the bell icon so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're gonna have a great day, whatever you're doing, and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.